Hey everyone, welcome to the microbiology section of First Aid Express. My name is Sean Alemi. I'm a resident at UCSF in the Department of Otolaryngology. I'll be guiding you through the next microbiology section. We'll be starting off with uh, some of the classification schemes of fungi and we'll be talking about other specific fungal organisms. Again, as I've done in my previous lectures, I really like to present information from microbiology, but I also like to pull in lots of integrations. I want to teach you guys as much as possible in the time that I have. Uh, so I'm going to be pulling in some path, farm, neuro, physiology, as much as I can to help you create those unforgettable connections, those light bulb moments that will make you remember this stuff on test day. Along the way, I'm going to ask you questions. I'm going to try to challenge you. Um, some of them will be rapid fire. Others will uh, involve more time to think. Don't be discouraged if you don't know the answer. The point of these questions is to help you learn by exposing what you don't know. I would rather that you miss it here with me and get it right on test day. So now that the formalities are out of the way, let's get started. Next up is mycology. First section is systemic mycosis, which is essentially a disseminated fungal infection, oftentimes mimicking tuberculosis. Within this category, there are four fungi that I want you to know. Histoplasma, Blastomyces, Coccidioides, and Paracoccidioides. These are unique because each one is really endemic to a specific geographic location. And we're going to go over these locations as we cover each type of fungus. The boards likes to test you on these fungi by giving you the region in which that disease is known to occur. So it's definitely worth your time to memorize them. Oftentimes getting that question right really just comes down to identifying the correct geographic region and knowing what that fungus should look like under a microscope. But don't worry, we're here to help you with that. There are some general things that you should know which all four of these fungi have in common. For example, all four of them are dimorphic. Now what do I mean by the word dimorphic? Well, what that means is that they exist in two different forms depending on the temperature. At cold temperatures of 20 to 25 degrees, they're going to exist in the mold form. Whereas at warmer temperatures of 37 degrees, which is essentially body temperature, they're going to exist in the yeast form. My oh my, how are we going to remember this one? I like to remember it with the mnemonic mold in the cold, yeast in the heat. Now the only exception to this rule is that coccidioides is going to exist as a spherule at body temperature. One key thing to remember is that fungi are transmitted when people inhale spores. Now how do these spores end up throughout your body. So these spores are found in the soil, they end up in your lungs. So here you are entering the trachea, going into the lungs, and then they end up in the heart. Once they're in the bloodstream, they're going to disseminate to the liver, the spleen, they might even end up in your adrenal glands. Now remember this is much more common in immunocompromised hosts. Let's start with histoplasma. This fungus is endemic to the states bordering the Ohio River Valley and Mississippi River. Think center of the country. Histoplasma is found in soil enriched by bird and bat droppings. Frequently, the hint you'll be given on the boards is that the person is a cave explorer or spelunker, as these individuals often have close encounters with bats. On the tissue level, macrophages will phagocytose histoplasma spores so you can diagnose this fungal infection on a biopsy. And what you're going to see is budding yeast within macrophages. Here you are. You see the macrophage filled with budding yeast. You can see little budding yeast filling it all here. Here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. These guys are having a party in there. Now this is usually all the information you're going to need to make that diagnosis. Now remember, patients are going to have respiratory symptoms in addition to their other systemic findings. Next is Blastomyces. This fungus is endemic to the center part of America and the states east of the Mississippi River. This is the rarest of the fungi to affect humans, but it's definitely the most severe if you're unfortunate enough to get it. Do you remember the three key systems affected by blastomycosis? Well, I'll tell you. There are the bones, the lung, and skin. Oh man, how are we going to remember all of that? Well, here's a mnemonic you can try. Blasto affects 
bone, lung, and skin. A key to recognizing blastomycosis is seeing these broad-based buds on biopsy, shown in this picture. You can see these buds are sitting right next to each other, and they're broad. This means that at the base, where you see one spore coming off of the other, there is a broadness to that, as opposed to it being narrow. So this would be narrow-based budding. See how this bridge between them is narrow, whereas these are almost broad. This is in contrast to cryptococcus, which we'll talk about a little bit later, which has a narrow base bud. So remember, broad based budding blasto. Use that alliteration to help you remember it on test day. Okay, next is coccidioides. You'll find this fungus in the southwestern states of the United States, such as California and Arizona. For this reason, this fungal infection has been given various other names such as San Joaquin Valley Fever or just Valley Fever and Desert Fever. Hey, do you remember what form this fungus exists at body temperature? Right, this one is spherules, not yeast. To be more exact, the fungus exists as several small spores or endospores found within a spherule, which you can see in this figure right here. Here you can see the big spherule. That's the big guy right there. And a bunch of little tiny spores populating the inside of it. Here they are. Try to remember this picture. It's definitely likely to show up on many of your tests. Coccidiotomycosis has been linked to earthquakes in California, which tend to disrupt the soil and throw spores into the air where they are inhaled and then become spherules in the lungs. The last of the four systemic fungi is Paracoccidioides, which is endemic to Latin America. This fungus has an interesting shape that has been likened to a captain's wheel due to its multiple buds. See here how it takes the appearance of that captain's wheel. If you don't believe me, Google captain's wheel and see what comes up. Finally, while you can treat local infections with azole such as ketoconazole or fluconazole, disseminated fungal infection must be treated with systemic antifungals. The most commonly used agent is amphotericin B, nicknamed Amphoterrible. This is a really nasty drug that you should hopefully try to avoid for as long as possible. Okay, so that concludes the section on systemic fungal infections. But what about some of the more common things? Things that you might even see in clinic when you're a third year med student. For that, we turn to cutaneous mycoses. These are the fungal infections that affect the skin. The first fungus is Malassezia furfur, which causes tinea versicolor. As you can see here, tinea versicolor presents as these pale hypopigmented patches on the skin in darker colored individuals. And in lighter colored individuals, it actually presents as hyperpigmented darker patches on fair colored individuals. You can see them right here. Can you tell me what time of year you're more likely to develop this infection? It typically occurs in the summer months in hot, humid weather. Oftentimes, people will have this condition for some time, but they just won't know it. But in the summer, when they take their shirts off and they start playing in the sun, then these hypopigmented macules become more easily visible because the skin around them becomes tan. Oh wait, a little derm reference coming here. I just use the word. I use the word macule. Can you tell me the difference between a macule and a papule? Well, a macule is a flat lesion, whereas a papule is a raised lesion. Put another way, if you closed your eyes and touched a macule, you'd have no idea it was there, but you'd be able to feel a papule. Now this makes people come to the doctor after being at the beach for a day or two, and now they think they've developed some sort of a rash by being at the beach, when in fact, it just exposed something that they already had. Malassezia furfur, the causative agent, contains lipases which degrade fat in the skin and produce acids that then cause damage to melanocytes. Hang on a second, do you remember the function of melanocytes? Well, of course, they make melanin, right? So, if you knock them out, you'll have areas of decreased pigmentation. You can diagnose this fungal infection by taking skin scrapings from the patches and applying them to a KOH sample. 
Do you remember how the appearance of malassezia furfur is described under a microscope? It is usually described as having a quote-unquote spaghetti and meatball appearance seen here. Here are your spaghetti strands right there, and you have some meatballs here, and a meatball here, and a meatball there, and a meatball there. All right, so think spaghetti and meatballs. You think tinea versicolor. Now, this is a really common disorder, so you're very likely to see it. These markings can be mistaken for a skin disorder known as vitiligo. You can distinguish the two using a woods lamp, which is a simply a tool that shines ultraviolet light and looks for fluorescence on the skin. Now, tinea versicolor will be negative under a woods lamp. It's going to appear yellow-green and have no fluorescence, whereas vitiligo will be positive, so it will have fluorescence. Hang on a second. Another quick dermatology reference coming. Do you remember the mechanism of vitiligo? So think back. This is an autoimmune attack against melanocytes. And what did we say melanocytes do? They produce melanin. So autoimmune destruction of melanocytes will also cause you to lose pigmentation of the skin. So remember now, this has a different mechanism for the same outcome. The malassezia species is also responsible for dandruff in the hair. This may help you remember why topical selenium sulfide, which you can see in the store as Selsun Blue, is a shampoo. It's helpful in treating dandruff in the hair and against tinea versicolor. The next fungal organisms are the dermatophytes, which include several fungal species such as Microsporum, Trichophyton, Epidermophyton. These species are the causative agent of skin infections on various parts of the body because they like to colonize keratinized epithelium in warm, moist areas. Of these, Trichophyton is the most common of the dermatophytes. Depending on what body part is involved, the name of the infection is slightly different, but it's always going to be preceded by the word tinea. For example, a dermatophyte infection of the foot is called tinea pedis, and it is known as athlete's foot. Can you tell me what it is called when it affects the body? This time it's going to be called tinea Corpus. Remember, corpus means body. Here's a picture of tinea corporis. This is what it looks like. Commonly a raised lesion with a central area of clearing. There's your central area of clearing. Sometimes this is described as ringworm. It's itchy, you scratch it, some of it comes off onto a microscope slide, bada bing, you drop a little bit of KOH on there, bada boom, you're going to see hyphae. I'm sure you'll see this again in the dermatology section, but while we're here, let's fire off a few more. Now, what do you call it if it affects the nails? This is going to be called tinea unguium. A lot of U's in that word, unguium. And if it affects the groin or gluteal folds, then it's going to be called tinea cruris.